Hey, welcome to the NZ Everyday Investor. I'm Darcy Angaro, and today we're covering property in our Practical Property series, catching up with Andrew Duncan, real estate blogger, consultant, agent extraordinaire. And we're covering everything that you need to know if you're buying a property or if you're selling a property at auction. So in these two episodes, you're going to know everything, almost everything I'd suggest, that you would need to know before you get to it so that you'll be prepared if you're buying or selling property that you own directly. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. So I'm sitting in front of Andrew Duncan. How are you, Andrew? Fantastic, thank you. Now, Andrew is a, a real estate blogger, a real estate consultant, an agent, everything you want to know about real estate, especially if you're based in uh, Wellington or anywhere in New Zealand, really. Hey, you're the man. Absolutely. Hope to, be, hope to be helpful. Hope to be helpful. I, I'm pretty confident you will be helpful. Otherwise, you would not be here. Now, Andrew, we're going to be talking about a couple of things. We're going to be talking about everything that you need to know about selling your home. And you might be thinking, well, how the heck does this tie into wealth or building wealth? And you know, property is one of those things, right? So I guess with, um, with any of the asset classes, property is often owned directly. Residential property is often owned directly. So at some stage, we might need to sell our property to, to move on to greener pastures or to go up to something bigger and better. Would you consider your own home as an investment, Andrew? Let's start there. It's one of those things. You know, we only sell generally every seven to ten years on average. Uh, for many of us, it's the biggest asset we'll ever control or own. And when it comes time to sell, that's a real opportunity to uh, influence our own net worth, uh, getting the process right. Uh, I've seen so many times where it, when when a selling process goes right, it can in increase the value by five or ten percent. For your average home in Auckland, you're talking fifty to a hundred thousand um, dollars. That's a tax-free benefit to you if you don't yeah. fall under the bright line test. Yeah. Uh, and and so these, you know, getting getting it all right can have a big swing on your personal yeah. net worth situation. So, uh, you know, I see it as an investment. It, it, it's you know, I do buy into that old. Um, you know, rich dad, poor dad philosophy that your own home is a liability and, a, and an income generating asset is a, a yeah. is a true investment. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, it, when something can influence your personal situation so much, it's it's really important to be yeah um, to have a to look at it through a financial lens. It's a life decision with financial implications. I've heard you use that phrase before. Have I? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's that's a good one, isn't that's it? A good one. <laughs> <laughs> is it one of my cat posters that I put up? <laughs> <laughs> Some real nuggets in these shows. That's hey? So good. That's cool, but yeah, because it's one of those questions that I, that I hear every now and then. People try to answer, you know, is is should your own home actually be an investment? And it depends on what you mean by investment, of course. And you can expand that term out to be as big as you want to capture almost everything in the world that you do is actually technically an investment. But I think when it comes to building wealth, often your own home is the home base, isn't it? It's usually the anchor. It's the very first move that you would make before you would take a next step, which could be an investment property or properties and then businesses, and then shares, and so on and so forth. So why? what are some of the common themes, the common things that you see when people make that decision in the end to sell their property? It's so often about family. It comes back to that. You know, people looking for more space, people looking for maybe more of a, a backyard for their kids to play in, uh, uh, trying to provide the best possible life they can. Yeah. Um, but I think a really important question to uh, to ask yourself and each other is, is, do you really need to move? Do you actually need a bigger home? And in New Zealand in particular, we aspire to these big, big properties so we can yeah. live separately from each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that can be a uh, keeping up with the Joneses thing. It can be a we can afford to do it, so let's do it. Um, so just, just really examine those issues I'd suggest and, and try and decide, do you actually need a bigger home? The reason I say that is, going back to the investment question, you know, the more money you have tied up in your own home, it, it, it doesn't create freedom for you. It's an asset and, and, a, and it can be a good investment, but um, the more debt, the more equity you have tied up in your own property, it, it, it can reduce your freedom, not enhance it. So uh, before you just naturally jump to a bigger property because you're at that stage financially, you want to look at, should I be buying an investment property instead? Or are there other investments I should be Correct. I should be looking at? And that's that tension often I see this as well with clients is that you know, they're at some sort of critical juncture where maybe they had dinner at someone's house on the weekend and it was a much nicer home and 
how could they afford it? Well, maybe we could afford it. And that sets off a chain of thinking. And then you think about your kids getting into a different school zone. and School zones are another one. Absolutely. Totally. Such a big one. But I guess it's like, well, you know, you have this tension between the, the financial brain and then the emotional brain. You know, we want to take care of our family. We want to, we want the very best. And it's effectively, it is your duty to look after your kids, right? And you might interpret that as getting in a bigger home with a backyard and a safer neighborhood and a better school zone. But on the, some, on the other side, there's often this thought of, well, we have this equity in our home. We have this income. Shouldn't we be leveraging off that to do something else? And so there is, I see this war all the time. And sometimes it's within a couple. You know, one wants to do one, one wants to do the other. They try to merge it. Then usually it's a trade-off. Then they say they're, they're doing it for financial reasons, but really in the end they swap and they do it for lifestyle reasons when they saw an investment property that was worth twice as much and they saw themselves living there. So is that kind of what you see as well when you're catching up with potential vendors? Is, do you see this dynamic playing out? Absolutely. Uh, nearly every time. And I guess I'd say to, it's surprising how many people don't seek advice at that point. Right. So, you know, particularly from uh, someone like yourself, um, to, to just have a sounding board to discuss yeah. these things openly. And well, where do people go? Like nor normally, like in practice, where do these vendors normally go before you would catch up with them? I th family mainly uh, and friends, as you, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's hard because not a lot of people would have you know, a really successful property investor that they could sit down and talk to and, yeah. and discuss these things with and someone who's carved a path slightly differently to what they, they might be looking at themselves. Right. So it's... And I guess it's like, well, like, like anything, right? If you're trying to build wealth, if you're trying to build a business, ideally, it would be good if you had some sort of team. Like I, I know, and you know as well, like we, could, we could instantly say, well, there's, there's obviously there's your lawyer, there's your financial advisor, you know, who can talk to the banks, but also talk about an overarching plan. Um, maybe there's an insurance person, there's uh, a real estate agent or agents. Uh, yeah. Who else? Does feel feel like I'm missing somebody? Maybe a marriage counselor. It could be for the end. <laughs> I don't know, but like you need to have a team, right? Before you make, because like you said at the start, it's a very serious decision that you're making, and a very serious decision. So and it's it easy make to sense? it's easy to create a confirmation bias. You know, where you look for everything that that, that you want to support your decision right. that you've already made in your head. <laughs> That's right. Like all the friends we know that have done it for the, for similar reasons, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So take me through a typical sort of story where you meet with somebody and you're talking to them about simple questions like what should I do to get my home ready for sale? Because everybody, every vendor, every seller wants to get the very best for their home. What's a typical conversation that you have with someone when they're asking you those questions? Typical conversations I'll have will be around how far do we need to go? Uh, what do, what should we spend money on? Yeah. The best things are generally the cheapest things. Gardening, it's the painting, it's the cleaning. Uh, it's simple things like new kitchen cupboard handles, which you can buy for $5 each from Bunnings, and you know you swap them over with a screwdriver. Yeah. It's those uh, simple and, and slightly boring things that, that make all the difference. Yeah, It's pretty rare that I suggest to people to take on full-scale renovations. Uh, it's true that kitchens and bathrooms really sell a home, uh, but it's also true that you don't always expensive. get a massive return on investment. You know, the return on investment yeah. on gardening is, is much higher than on right. bathrooms in general. Okay. And, and just uh, a house wash. Just a house wash, absolutely. Uh, with kitchens and bathrooms, I'll say to people, look, if you have contacts in that area that uh, maybe you have a, a brother-in-law who's a, who's a plumber or uh, and, and you can get these things done quickly and cost effectively, then by all means use those contacts and, and use those um, uh, connections that you have. Uh, but generally you can go a long way just with painting and gardening and cleaning yeah. and a good house wash. Yeah. Uh, especially house washing and water blasting that, that know, can make yeah. a massive difference. Tell me about it. And just clean your windows properly. And just cleaning your windows properly. Yeah. People don't expect a perfect home, um, but a, a, a clean, um, uncluttered home uh, right. generally sells very well. So typically less than 10 grand for many Absolutely. small first homes. Absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned something interesting there. Like, I guess when they come to that realization and it's, and it's time to sell, stepping way back in time would be awesome, right? Like if we had a hot tub time machine and we can go back in time and correct an error. Like you made the assumption that it was the best that they could do when they bought their first home and now it's time to move on. One of the things that I often see is that people don't make their best move for their first move. 
they make the move which they feel is the safest move, not the best move. And in 10 years' time, when property prices are worth twice as much, that's when they pay for it, all right? Because now they're selling that home and they're buying something that they could have bought potentially 10 years ago when they bought their first place, but they're paying twice as much for it. So, and I say this all the time, you know, you should always be buying tomorrow's home at today's price. Obviously, there are, there are times where you can't, right? It's so smart, though. It's, I mean, also from the point of view, it's much easier to move when it's just, say, one or two of you rather than when you've got kids involved and pets and things. Yeah. It's so much more stress to the process. My, Luckily, my wife was uh, really smart on that point. And when we yeah. brought our home together, we brought a, it was just the two of us, but we brought a four-bedroom home with rumpus rooms and a playground across you the really? street. And yeah, I mean, it was entirely her idea, not mine, which, you know. <laughs> Women are often smarter with financial decisions. Absolutely. They, they think way long term. Holistically as well, rather than just yeah. getting attached to a price or a, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. a bargain. So. Whereas, I guess, the, the male, the male side, no, yeah, it's a general rule, of course, because I like to make general rules. You know, it's a, it's a competition. We're trying to get a good deal. We're trying to get the price down and go for MVP, minimal viable, viable property, every time we possibly can, right? Whereas... You do need to listen to the other half sometimes, eh? I've got some, I've got, I've got some brains out there, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she and, and Anna was. And if you don't have a wife, just borrow somebody else's. That's right. Right. <laughs> Get some perspective. I think it's really handy to have another set of eyes look at any problem. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah. so take me through the next step. Then they, they are scanning their circle of friends to find a potentially a real estate agent. Let's assume that they're not going to DIY it. Um, let's assume that they're going to do the right thing, in my opinion, and I'm sure about yours as well. And they're, they're using a real estate agent professional to market their home. How do people typically choose a real estate agent and how should they? Touching on that uh, doing it yourself point, I mean, you can understand the, the, the draw to that. Yep. It's a, a large investment that you make in a real estate professional. Uh, and when you hear lots of bad things about it, it's understandable that people want to try and do it themselves. Um, the best thing a real estate agent can do is coordinate competition between buyers and that's a very hard thing to do on your own so that's the main message I'd say to, to DIYers when you go to choose one it's it's really common for owners to look at real estate agents as a commodity uh, for want of a better term as a necessary evil uh, but that's a it's uh, it's short-sighted in my opinion the from working in this industry for 18 years the difference in skill level and professionalism and attention to detail and just knowledge is vast. Right. A, so a, you're not a homogenous group of people. You're that, a group of individuals. It's not like buying milk. Yeah. Right. It's it's uh, uh, there's some really skillful practitioners out there, uh, yeah. and choosing the right one can make a really big difference to your net worth. Right. So recommendations is a really good place to start. Talking to friends. Um, one that's so simple, but most people don't do. It's crazy how many people who are selling a home who don't actually go and visit open homes and check out agents in the area. Right. You know, they right. save the open homes until they're trying to buy, but it's a really good way to see them at work. That is our shop front is open homes. Yeah. Right. Just so, go and check them out. So everybody that's coming to your open home, if you're a real estate agent, effectively are coming to, it's like a job interview, right? Absolutely. You're demonstrating how you work. So it makes sense then that if you're shopping for an agent, if you think you've got a short list, just have a look at what they're selling and how they do it, right? Yeah, that's a good tip. And, and don't tell them that you're thinking of selling because then, of course, they'll follow up and be great and, of course, they'll treat you wonderfully. But right. just, just act like a buyer. Right. Um, what Mystery sort of information shop. do they have? Yeah. How informative is their collateral about the property you're looking at? Do they follow you up? Do they call you back? Um, do they send you follow-up emails? Yeah. Uh, you can evaluate the skill level very quickly just with a 10-minute yeah, you know, open-home visit on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. That's a good point. And so let's say that they've established a short list of, say, like two or three. Like, what, what would you recommend? How many real estate agents should you interview before you give them a job? I think three is a good place to start. You'll get different ideas on what to do to the house before you sell it. Uh, you'll get different personalities. Yeah. And, and often it's about finding someone you gel with and feel like you can have a candid conversation with. Yeah. Uh, it, it's... And, and the, the one agent won't be the right one for every single person. Uh, it's got to be someone who fits with your sure. personality. And I would imagine that it would feel a bit awkward, though. Like if you were having a candid conversation and letting your guard down a bit with three different professionals and you knew that you're only giving one of them a job, it's kind of like the bachelorette, right? Like you're, you're a bit slutty with all of them. And then you have to choose one in the end, right? Give them a rose. So I only know that because my... My wife watches it. I've never watched that. 
is it kind of like do you think some people don't get three agents in the room because of that fear of having to let two of them down and will they you know you treat me badly every time I see them in the supermarket next time I see them, you know? I'm so like that, you know, I want to have one builder that I deal with. I want to have one plumber, and I do. And yeah. I don't want to interview three or four people every time I... Often these people are people we know and they're, they're family friends. And, and so you don't want to be seen to be holding them to account or, you know, or, or making them compete against everybody else. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very it's very Kiwi thing as well to to want to have your trusted advisor. Yeah. Um, real estate's a big ticket item though you know it's a, it's a big deal yeah. um so i think still try and and uh encourage yourself to be smart and get a few opinions sure um at the same time if you already know who you're going to use it's a little bit dickish to interview three or four other people because because agents good ones put a lot of effort into those into that appraisal process so Try not to waste people's time if you already have, you know, if, if you're right. adamant, you, you, you already have your real estate agent and you're just interviewing right. a few other people to keep them honest. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I feel yeah. like it's a bit tough, but... It is uh, It is tough though, isn't it? Because I know that, yeah, they're working for free really until that sale goes through. So you, you need to know, especially if you're not, if you've never been paid a commission, you, you'll never really appreciate this, right? But if you're asking for somebody's advice and you know that you're not paying for it, you know that the only way they're going to get paid is if there's an outcome. Don't don't you know? Don't abuse that, right? Like yeah. it's it is actually someone's livelihood. They might have not um, dropped the kids off to school that morning just to sit in front of you. And if you're not serious, don't waste the time. That's that's the key point. You know, you, the amount of nights. You know, agents are often meeting with people at seven o'clock at night. You know, they're not putting their kids in bed. They're they're with you talking about your house, which is a wonderful service to do for free. Uh, at the same time as as having been an agent for many years, I'd always rather be called in than not and, and offered that sure. opportunity. So don't feel bad about giving them the chance to come and interview for the job, and they'll you can only pick one in yeah. general <laughs> yeah, unless you're selling commercial real estate. Yeah. Uh, so so don't feel bad about saying no as real estate agents. You're not going to be a good real estate agent unless you can handle rejection. Correct. That's right. And you can tell because they've been in the industry for more than two years. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, and world-class agents list around 80% of the houses that they appraise. So even sure. the very best ones miss out on... Right. One out of every five they're losing anyway, even if they're awesome. That's good to know. Okay. So let's say you were called up and you, you didn't drop your kids off at school. Instead, you, you met at a cafe or whatever and you're, you're doing a listing appraisal. You're sitting in front of somebody. What typically is the real estate agent going to be talking about when they're sitting in front of a potential vendor? Hopefully, the the vendor in their situation. Hopefully, you know, a, a good sign of a good agent is: do they ask more questions than? You know, do they spend more time listening than talking? Uh, rare, but but a very good sign. Yeah. One tip on that: I think it's a really smart idea to meet the agent for the first time at a neutral location, which might sound incredibly strange. Okay. But when the agent comes to your house and that's the first time you've met them, you get it can be easy to be butted up you know they walk around your house and say oh this is wonderful and oh, isn't this cool like they're, they're professionals at building rapport and they tell you your house is wonderful so many times that you get lulled into this kind of false sense of security so this might sound incredibly weird but take the house out of the equation and just meet the real estate agent for a coffee like you would a, a solicitor or a financial advisor or a mortgage broker and just find out what makes them tick find out what they're like first uh, and then the second meeting, you know, if they're your chosen one, you're going to deal with them a lot. <laughs> That's right. They're going to be coming into your home a lot. And they're going to be yeah. good no matter what your house is like. I think a lot of our owners overestimate how important the house is in this process. The, the, the agent is going to be good no matter what, your, what kind of property you're selling. Right. Gotcha. That's actually a really subtle but quite a key message, right? Like they're going to be, the agent is going to be like stand alone. They're going to perform how they're going to perform. I'll put your a good agent in front of any house. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those are two separate things. The real estate agent and your house are two separate things. Their skill level and their ability is, is separate from your yeah. property. A lot of owners fall into the trap of, oh, I want someone who really believes in my house and who, who you know, really appreciates it. And you can still evaluate that. You can still have a second meeting before you commit. Correct. Um, but your house is what it is. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and what happens is I will go to people's houses and we'll spend an hour and a half talking about the house. What we should be talking about is that owner's situation, what they're trying to achieve, what strategy is going to best help them through that process, rather right than there, you can yeah. get sidetracked talking about the rumpus room and the glass door yeah. they changed two years ago Correct. and the insulation they added and what our value it has. And all these things are important, but they're Correct. secondary. 
Absolutely. And then, and they get, that's where the value of real advice is, is the, all of the stuff that isn't the tangible, right? Yes. But you can see the material, but really it's what, what does it mean? What are you trying to accomplish? And any advisor should be in that layer, not in the product layer, right? Which is often what we resort to, right? Spot on, a product layer, that's a nice way to put it. So to come back to the question, they should be asking about your situation, they should be asking about timeframes, um, they should be asking, trying to help you clarify what your what your needs are. Right. Uh, ideally, they should be asking questions like, "Do you even need to sell?" You know, the, 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 one of the first questions I'll ask because I often would uh, deal with people who are um, they've bought their first home and they're trying to move up to their second. So the first question is, "Can you keep your first home as a rental property? Would it make a good investment property?" Yeah. Uh, and then trying to uh, advise you on perhaps timeframes then you're getting into what other advice they need, where they should start looking for the information they need. Yeah, I was just dealing with a client right now who sold their home and they just, they've just they just recently signed up to purchase a new home, right? And the very first meeting they had with their real estate agent was actually, um, and they were on the phone with me, they said to ask you, is it possible for them to keep their home so they don't have to sell? And I thought, Whoever that agent is, is actually... Keep them on. Yeah, yeah definitely. And they did. And, and, and they did actually have to sell. So it, it worked. You know, funnily enough, if you take care of your, your customers, it's actually a good outcome. And take a long-term approach to that yeah. relationship. Yeah. But um, so let's say that they, um, they have the conversation. They decide that, yep, they do need to sell. Talk to me about the different options that a vendor would potentially have in terms of how to market their home. How does that how does that work? Probably the next big key important point to look at is what's going to be the best strategy for them. Yeah. Uh, so the main ones you'll see in New Zealand are, you know, selling by auction, selling by a, a, a tender or a deadline sale. Uh, now what, this can be very confusing for buyers and sellers, but a tender and a deadline sale or a um, set sale date yeah. are generally all the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you have no idea what the other person is doing. That's you have no idea what the other person is doing. You have a set date the agent wants you to offer by. Yeah. Uh, ideally, the owner will look at all the offers on that day. Yeah. Sometimes you can offer early, sometimes you can't. You have to ask those questions of the salesperson. Yeah. Um, or you'll have a buy negotiation, um, yeah. which is where there's no set date to sell the property. You can make an offer at any time. But as soon as an offer is made, most agents will call for other interest and you can essentially end up in a deadline right. tender situation anyway. Gotcha. Or you'll have a... a a situation where there's a set asking price, okay, and which every buyer prefers, obviously, um, whether that's a buyer inquiry over figure or a set asking price or a you know expressions of interest from or so price by negotiation, tender, and auction. It's kind of those are the main ones. Mo most of the methods fall into these main four, right? And then those main four, most of those main four are used when it's unknown as to where the market is at. Is that right? It's it's a really good question. The way I've always looked at it, and every agent's a bit different, an auction is really hard to beat if you have a property which is going to attract a large pool of interest. Uh, so a misconception in real estate I see a lot is people think, oh, I'm going to auction the unusual properties because they're hard to price. Auctions work best if there's more than one person trying to buy it, and unusual properties often don't attract a large market. So auctions are best when you've got you know a doer up a character property on a you know, on a good street. That's the property you want to auction, where you just put everybody in a room and let them fight it out. Yeah. Tenders, on the other hand, or deadline sales and these sorts of things, can work best whether you have you know, one buyer or, or half a dozen. Right. Um, so they're kind of a middle ground, which can work in all situations right. and allow you to kind of test the market and see what's possible. Because um, especially in a hot market, it's a risk to price a house right at the start because if it sells quickly, you'll walk away feeling like, did I get the best I could? Yeah. And if you price it too high, you could be sitting on the market for weeks and not have anything happen. Sure. And real estate markets can be very price sensitive. Right. So it's it's really easy to get that wrong. Uh, so tenders can be a good middle ground. Um, if you think your property is going to be quite hard to sell and attract a, a unique market, um, maybe it's a leasehold property or maybe it's something with. Um, you know, consenting issues, serious ones, yeah. then you might look at a buy negotiation or a priced strategy because yeah. if the buyer for your property comes along, you need to be able to make a deal with them straight away. Got it. <laughs> you don't want to make them wait for three weeks for an auction and right. potentially yeah. they get distracted. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So in Wellington, for example, I know tenders are quite common, um, whereas in Auckland, auctions are rather common. 
and other parts of the world, you other parts of the world, yeah, it's probably true, but other parts of the country, there's probably a lot more variety in terms of, you know, there, there'll be a price on the odd one by negotiation, set date sale. But I guess when it comes down to it, what you said before is that you're just trying to get multiple people to bid on that property at the same time, especially if you're trying to maximize the price and, and get the very best, right? That's, that's the art of it, isn't it? Competition is the key. Everything you do when you're selling, if you're trying to maximize the price, is about how do I generate more competition. Right. Gotcha. Uh, that's that's what the, the advertising is all about. That's what the strategy is all about. That's what choosing the right agent is all about. Yeah. Uh, that's what's going to get you a good, a sure. good result. W- like when I first started in my career, I was just doing mortgages. That's that's how I started doing this, and I, w- I worked quite closely with a team of real estate agents, like a really high performing team of real estate agents in, in Auckland. And um, there's so much that I learned from that. But one of the things that I I remember is that they they almost had two sales that they made to vendors. One was to get the listing, but the other one was to get a marketing budget. Because if they could get a marketing budget, then number one, it tested how seriously they were in selling. But number two, it, it helped get those pool of people in to to bid on the same day. So how important is it to actually you know, spend a, a big fat wad on marketing and what should people watch out for when they're making that decision if they're thinking of selling? Such a good topic to talk through uh, because a lot of owners, understandably, approach this situation and they look at the real estate agent and they say, well, I'm going to pay you fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and you're asking me for another, yeah. you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, sometimes ten or 15000 in in marketing and, and why am I paying these two bills? This is crazy. But I guess you need to understand that the, they're two very separate things. Um, with most real estate companies, the agent won't make any money from that marketing spend. That investment you make, and you should look at it as an investment, is all about attracting people to your property. Uh, you think of any other business you run. You know, you wouldn't run a bakery without advertising. You know, if, you, if you'd advertise a, a four dollar muffin, you're gonna. You should advertise a, a million dollar home. So a smart investment in that space is. is well warranted mm. and you should budget for that every agent has their different schools of thought on whether you should spend it more online or whether you should spend it more in, in print uh, and to some extent you kind of have to trust the agent that you've chosen as to mm. what is going to work in your market and for your type of property mm. for some properties it might be more of a print based approach for some properties it might be more of an online based spend uh, I, I like to see agents using tools like Facebook and Google Display, the Google Display Network, um, these modern tools as well, I think these are really important. You might think Facebook's a crazy place to advertise a house, but it, it does work in my experience. We bought our last some from that. Fantastic. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, really go crazy on photography, and uh, there are these things called Metaport Virtual Tours, which are kind of like, are like Google Earth inside your house. They are amazingly good value for money. Um, mm. Drone shots, mm. if you're not too near an airport. Uh, Floor plans, yeah. spend money on this stuff because it makes it easy for the buyer to fall in love with your home. Got it. Okay. And it's uh, the point that you made before is is quite key that they're not necessarily making money out of the marketing spend that you're doing. And that does purely benefit you irrespective of whether there's a sale through that agent or not. Because you might get market awareness through one agent. For whatever reason, that listing agency falls over. Maybe the neighbor down the road remembers it. And it's hard to know whether they were attracted to it because of that. That's another issue. But let's say that it, it's good anyway because you're going to attract people that might pay, pay off later on, right? That's right. And if you, if that, say that three thousand dollars spend on marketing uh, gets you four buyers instead of one, or five buyers instead of two, which yeah. is really common, I mean, suddenly that's a different ball game. If you've got five people trying to buy a house instead of one or two, that yeah. you're that five grand will be paid back yeah um, totally. many many times over okay so now we talked about how it's really important to have some people on your team you know a financial advisor a lawyer um, a real estate agent at the, at the very least what kind of conversation should potential vendors have with their lawyer it's really important to engage a lawyer early on in the process yeah. uh, discuss with them any changes you've made to the home particularly if they don't have consent, which is really common. You know, a lot of people have added carports or um, taken away walls, and, and, and this often happens without consent. Uh, so that's not the end of the world, but it's important that you disclose Close to these. it, though, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important that you share, that you are open about these things. And what a lawyer can help you do is, early on in the process, 
uh, you'll have to prepare a, usually a, a contract for buyers to, to use and, and so they can help you decide what conditions you might need in there or what, what vendor warranties you might need to cross out to protect you going forward. What disclosure uh, you make. Disclosures yeah. you make and uh, you should proof those with your solicitor. The agent will help you usually draft these things but you should proof these with the solicitor before you put anything out into the public marketplace. Mm. Mm. Uh, you should also you know, get your title checked, uh, make sure you're, if you're selling, for instance, a cross lease home, make sure your flats plan is okay. Uh, just discuss the fact that you're selling with your lawyer and, and just have a, a candid conversation. Um, they may also be a good source of recommendations about real estate agents if you don't have yeah. one already. Yeah. Uh, Can we just circle back to that, the unconsented works bet because we, we, I see this all the time and it seems to be more of an issue now than what it has been but the awareness of what kind of issue it is is delayed, and I think this is the, this is the case probably with any change, right? With any change that occurs in any one area, whether it's um, trust law, real estate agents, or you know, mortgage lending criteria, it all has this kind of interconnected flow-on effect, right? But usually it's delayed, and often I find that um, the, the real estate agents are pretty close to it because they're they're constantly seeing people, but your solicitor might be a little bit behind what the implications are on some things. And with unconsented works, a typical scenario that we see all the time is um, it might be a, a garage that was closed in and converted into a self-contained flat. Consent was never issued. Now, you have two issues that I've observed anyway, is that number one, you're gonna have issues with insurance. And number two, if you're gonna have issues with insurance, you're gonna have issues with your mortgage provider. Um, with or without the insurance, they're gonna be a bit worried about that. Way more sensitive in the last 12 to 18 months, I've noticed, than previous. But a lot of people aren't made to, like, they don't realize that. Like, a lot of vendors don't realize that by disclosing this, which they have to do, that could potentially sabotage the sale because you're knocking out all these potential buyers, right? What would you say to that? Is that something that you've, you've observed as, as picked up in recent years? Very much so. And it's hard to know, but it's potentially something that's kind of always been there, but people are just better at pushing out that information nowadays. Totally. Yeah. Uh, so you understand that certain things can have an influence on the process and you'll need to be realistic about that when it comes to your price expectations. Uh, so if something's not consented, if something's not on the cross-lease flats plan, um, buyers will find it, depending on the change that's been made, harder to get insurance and therefore harder to get a mortgage. Uh, so, and, and you can reduce your buyer pool drastically with some of these issues. So definitely got to keep this in mind and you'll have a call to make at some point if it is having a big effect as to whether you take the house off the market mm. try and pursue getting things accepted by the council Correct. or whether you um, bite the bullet and sell it Correct. as it is uh, but but understand that it, you can't just call it a non-issue uh, your real estate agent can only do so much correct they have to disclose what they've been told by you they have to ask you and either way your lawyer will advise you to anyway and then they'll also advise you to advise your bank, and then and now it is an issue regardless of what you think. And it like if you know, if if anything, this episode is a public service announcement to anybody thinking about selling their home, right? In this one area, if nothing else, if you ever think you might sell your home, make sure it's compliant. Yeah, we do and agree. You feel for people because a lot of the a lot of the defense from an owner's point of view is, oh well, no one told me about that when I brought it, and, and this is so often the case, uh, and and. It, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, it was just a different environment. People didn't know the questions to ask. There wasn't the same expectation around disclosure. Right. So uh, you also balance that with the fact that you probably made a really good gain out of your asset, even right. if you find out something wasn't consented after all these years. So right. it's just one of these things that... Because people kind of expect it, right? Like if you're looking at a home which you know has been added to at some stage, immediately you're going to be looking... Right? Have has everything been ticked off the list? Is this compliant? Is it safe? Is it at a good standard? So you, people are going to know anyway, and they're going to ask those questions. And if you don't actually disclose it, but you knew, you know, maybe this is a, a question for a lawyer. But you've got risks, right? Yeah, there are ongoing risks even after the sale has occurred. Uh, and there's a there's a scale with these things, you know, where um, some aren't so bad, some get a little bit trickier. Um, Dealing with an agent who has a a good um, track record of selling properties in the area will help because the agent will 
Correct. As long as they're not just going to sugarcoat things for you, we'll be able to say, yeah, we've sold a number of properties like this and we'll put it on the disclosure statement and Correct. let buyers you know, work through it. Um, or, look, that's going to scupper the process. You know, right. We really need to address that first. Totally. Uh, or the vendor you needs to, to sort it. Yeah, you need, you'll need to sort it out prior to settlement. That's right. At the very least. So That's I guess right. when, when you're deciding what kind of work to do to your home to make it more attractive during the marketing process, one of the questions even before that is, are there any known issues that you know might impede a sale? Yes. Because that's probably the first thing you need to deal with before and just, you go any further, right? And just be careful of sort of newish and experienced agents who uh, will say, oh, that shouldn't be an issue. We'll just put it on the market. Cause they, you know, they're so hungry to get a listing. They're so hungry to get a start. That Oh, that should be fine. Let's just see how it goes. Let's just see how it goes is not usually Especially when you're spending great 10 grand in marketing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so this is good. So let's um, let's keep going then. So we've got this uh, listing that's just signed up, right? So I'm, I'm the vendor, you're the agent, I've agreed to market my property, I'm going to throw 10 grand on the table, we're going to do an auction campaign. Three weeks, there's going to be an auction, I know I need to change the handles in my kitchen and clean the house for this Saturday where the open home is. Typically, what starts to happen during that marketing program? Like if I was the vendor, what would you be saying to me to help set my expectations? So it's a really nerve-wracking time for owners. Uh, you either worry that there's too few people coming through or there's too many coming through and it can be really hard to manage with family and uh, you've got a life to live in the meantime and you're trying to keep this house immaculate uh, like your mother-in-law is coming to visit you know, every single day and make kids' beds in the morning. So it's, it's not an easy time. First message would be to just relax and let the, let the process work. You know, you've, you've got the house ready, you've done your homework, you've picked an agent all you can really control is, is getting that property ready, making it easy for people to come and see it, and then try and just, just let go of the rest. Try, just and just chill, try and just ride the wave. Yeah. Um, do make it easy for people to view. So often buyers want to come through at 6 o'clock at night. You know, it's the witching hour if you've got kids. It's, it's a crazy time. Even if the house isn't 100% perfect, you're better to let them come through and let them see the house. You, you want buyers to come and see the property. You don't want to miss an opportunity there. Mm. Uh, so even if it means the the beds aren't perfectly made or mm. you know there's a couple of toys out, don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, but the main message would be just try and let that process take care of itself and know that until the auction day or until the tender day or until the deadline day, that's when you're going to need to make decisions. Mm. And try not to overthink it until that point. The agent will be having conversations with you, letting you know what buyers think, ideally giving you feedback. Mm. Um, some agents will try and ascertain your price feedback from buyers. Yeah. All this stuff comes with a grain of salt. I mean, the best price feedback you can have is offers on paper or people bidding at an auction. Yeah. Uh, so really, during that time, you should be looking at other houses in the market, trying to learn what houses like yours are selling for, yeah. uh, trying it's, to look at houses you're going to buy in the next round. are you are trying to move forward, so that's part of it, right? Absolutely. So, so I want to drill down on something which I know happens, and I know you know happens as well, but not a lot of vendors would know happens. And it's a bit of a conflict that potentially might be happening inside the real estate office with the other real estate agents. By the way, let me know if any of this is off limits to discuss. Bring it on. Bring it on? Cool. So every agency I know has different rules around how they split the commission received between the listing agent and the agent who introduces the buyer, right? So what happens if I'm listing with a real estate firm and I know that the listing agent is getting the majority of the of the commission or they will get all of the commission if they sell and introduce the buyer who buys it. Getting exposure to all the agents within that office, sometimes that's a selling feature uh, that that agent might be presenting. Hey, we've got a whole team of agents who have databases that are going to be helping market your, your program. But in reality, they are disincentivized in, in terms of allowing another agent within the office to sell their listing. Do you want to talk to me about that and how that works a little bit more? It's a huge selling advantage if the agent you choose makes it easy for other agents to sell your property. In Auckland, it's very common for you know a Barfoots agent to sell a Harcourts listing. Um, but whether that's easy to do or not really depends on the listing agent. And a lot of them will say, oh, we've got a really big team. But in, in reality, they don't actually make it very easy for their colleagues to sell the property you know they put rules around it like all viewings must come through me personally and yeah, you know i keep the key on my back pocket yeah, all the time that's and right and the vendor's got a little kitty cat and it can't be woken up after three in the afternoon and that's right blocking and, yeah. and a lot of owners fall into this trap of setting these rules because they want to maintain their privacy it can be hard to let go and just make it a bit of a free-for-all 
but the trade-off can be yeah. and, and for some owners it's understandable you know getting every last dollar is not always the number one priority but if you are about getting the best price make it available and make it easy for people to come and see it mm. now one question i would ask when you're evaluating agents to take it back a step would be what percentage of your properties that you've sold have been sold by other members of your team and what you're looking for there is probably a 30 40 percent split right. so so 30 40 percent has been sold by other team members yeah that's mm -hmm. right and you want to see examples of that you want them to, to show you specific examples of that that's proof that they work well with their team members and that they make it easy for their team members to, to just, to just get a copy buyers. of their their report card right like do they play well with their friends that's right <laughs> it's exactly, exactly what they don't because exactly what it is. <laughs> there's a high correlation between those that are high performing real estate agents and those who don't play well with their friends yes and if you're trying to maximize your sale price um, having a superstar real estate agent doesn't necessarily always correlate to getting the best price but being a good team player probably has a stronger correlation to getting a good price right that's right, and, and, and understand also in, in that nuanced situation that that other member of the team doesn't know you, hasn't met you, doesn't know your needs. They're, they're, they're getting paid by you, but they're almost working for the buyer if they're another, if they're mm. a team member of the listing agent. So the listing agent you should feel is there to fight for your correct for your end result. That's the other side of it, isn't it? Yeah, because you're, you're right. The, um, the, the agent who's introducing a buyer in, in your team, they are effectively working for... The buyer aren't they because they'll only be representing that one buyer yeah. in terms of your property yes right so that's the other side of it that i think warren's mentioning is that yes you do you do need there to be a bit of conflict right because you want that listing agent to fight for your interests um yeah so it, it goes both ways isn't it mm. yeah okay so tell me um we're marketing our home you know we're going through this 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 process uh talk to me about this term called kneecapping so I, I believe that my property will sell for $1.5 million because when the real estate agent appraised it, that's kind of, they, get, they gave me a, a number which was in that range. And they told me the first week open homes that, yeah, things are going good, lots of shoes outside. But the second week, people are starting to complain about the kitchen. And then the third week, eh, we don't have too many. You know, so that's what I call kneecapping. What, what, do, what do you call it in your We town? call it a monitor. We call it uh, when agents promise you the world but buy you an atlas. Nice. <laughs> I think I like that better, actually. Yeah, it's good. So this is unfortunately very common in real estate. And it's not so much prevalent now, but when I started years ago, you know, agents would even get trained in the art of, you know, conditioning owners mm. throughout the process. They That's call a it better con term, conditioning, conditioning in, the, yeah. in, in the industry. Um, the, you know, there's two markets. Um, you know, there's, there's the market when you go to appraise a property and then there's suddenly this different yeah. <laughs> downturn market as soon as your property goes on the market That's and right. suddenly everyone's talking about it. All the negative word. media, um, you know, all the negative articles in the Herald get collated onto a nice little collage <laughs> That's right. given to you. <laughs> now, so it's a it's a easy trap for agents to fall into as well because when you're interviewing for the job, too many owners put too much emphasis on the price that you appraise the property for. And this goes back to what we're talking about in terms of meeting in a cafe first. Um, and it's hard. If, if one agent's promising you 100 grand more for your house than the next one, it's hard not to be attracted to that. Totally. Yeah. But agents are incentivized to be really generous with their appraisals because that's going to help them get the business. And they don't, they're not really, Correct. it's not like their commission drops if they suddenly get you 100 grand less when it comes time to sell. It's a bit like hiring a builder. You know, the builder gives you a quote, you hire that builder. You're stuck with them. You know, you, you can't, if they're doing a 300 grand renovation, you can't just switch halfway through. It's, it's mm. extremely hard to do. That's right. So if it turns out, it tends to be out to be, you know, 15, 20% more than what they quoted you, then you're just stuck with it. Correct. Same with real estate agents, you get stuck with the one you choose. So, first step is to go back a step and just be mindful of the, you want an agent that says, hey, look, I'm not a valuer, I'm a marketer. Here is what other properties have sold for, and here is a rough guide to what you might get. But Mm. We don't want to have any preconceived limitations on price. Let's go out and get the best we can. That's an important thing to understand, right? Because there is the, the there is a, the whole system is set up to effectively buy the listing. Buy the listing is the right way to put it. Yeah, you you're buying into what the narrative is of the vendor that it's worth X amount because you spent way too much on doing a renovation two years ago. Yep. Therefore, it's worth X amount. You buy into that because you don't want to argue with them. You you're, you're at a job interview, so 
it's that's a tough right. one though, isn't it? You're but, not going to sit there and counsel them and say, oh, no, it's actually not worth that much because of blah, 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 blah. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, you, you run yourself out of a job very fast. Yeah. So, but it, but it also, I really don't like the conditioning sort of aspect. I think um, it's, it's a shame that there's much of that that goes on. And it's really unnecessary, I find. You know, most owners are, by the time they get on the market, they're committed. You know, they want it to work out. They want it to sell. And yes, you hope that they're sort of realistic as an agent when it comes time to, you know, the auction day or the deadline day. Mm. But the the this, this kneecapping that goes on is a real shame. I think people are smart, you know. People are pretty switched on and they can see this stuff from a mile away. So I think from agents it's, it's that do use that sort of approach is pretty short-sighted in my view i think yeah. um but if you're following a process like you say you're a marketer you're not a valuer yeah and if you're following a process which is designed to attract as many potential people to bid on that property on a chosen date then really you, you trust the process once you've commenced it right you trust the agent until you start the marketing and then once the marketing is starting now you just have to trust the process and really if you have to be told that the place isn't as worth as much as what you thought. Well, maybe some, maybe there's a bit of truth there. Maybe you were actually unrealistic, and maybe you do need somebody to bring you down to earth. And maybe it's painful, it's horrible, but you actually needed someone to knock you down. You're so you're so yeah. right that that spending the marketing money should give you that confidence, and choosing the right agent should give you that confidence. That even if the price is a bit lower than what you expected, yeah. then then that's probably a sign that that's roughly where your house sits at that point in time. Yeah. Um, one really good question to ask yourself when you're in that situation where you're confronted with prices which are lower than what you wanted is where do you see a better buyer coming from? Sure. Uh, is there some type of marketing that you didn't spend money on? Is there some miraculous avenue which wasn't tested? You, uh, if you don't have trust in the process that's been undertaken, then sure, that then potentially you could okay. understandably yeah. feel like that's maybe right. I need to try a different approach. Um, but if everything's been done right, if no stone's been left unturned, then where do you see a better buyer coming from? That's pretty simple, right? Let's not let your agent is purposefully acting like a muppet to stop no. you from selling your <laughs> no. home. They're gonna end up making nothing if the house yeah. doesn't sell. You know, your interests are actually surprisingly aligned at this point. Yes. <laughs> so don't turn on them. Yeah, interesting, eh? Yeah. So okay, so let's say we, we're, we're fast forwarding now, if we can, to the auction night. Yes. And yeah, on site, off site. You're in an auction room. There's three others before you. There's three others behind you. Whatever the story is, you're in a room. Um, as a vendor, we'll talk about buyers later on. But as a vendor, as a seller, what would you say to the seller on the day of the auction or right before the auction? What should they do to mentally get prepared about what's going to happen? Find someone you can take as a moral support, yeah. uh, particularly someone with uh, some sound financial knowledge. That's a really good idea too. Someone who doesn't have an emotional connection to the outcome. This is very hard. It's very hard to say, you know, stay relaxed. <laughs> it's yeah. extremely hard to do. If you've got a, you know, a million dollar asset on the line or, or something that's worth more, it's very hard to stay calm. Uh, but take it with a, you know, go in with a realistic pragmatic approach. If a sale is achieved, cool. If a result is brought about, which is sort of roughly close to what you want, but it's not as much as you hoped for, Ask the question, does it allow you to move on with your life? Does it allow you to achieve what you're trying to achieve? If so, look pretty hard at getting on with it. Mm. If a sale isn't achieved, then keep in mind that there are plenty of other avenues you can go down. Mm. For instance, if no one turns up and bids. This happens a lot. You know, we're, we're just, no one comes. Um, don't try not to be too disheartened. It's just an auction or a tender or any of these things. It's just one way to uh, achieve that goal. And by that stage, you've usually been on only on the market for three weeks, which is lower than the median uh, number of days to sell in basically every every town and city in New Zealand. So you're not an old listing yet. Um, buyers aren't going to suddenly think that you're, you know, there was a murder in your house or something like that. It, 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 you, people overestimate how much shame there is involved in that. Buyers just want a house. Buyers just want to buy a house they can afford. Yeah, it's not um, that complicated. It's not don't, that don't big a deal. Don't read too much into it. Is don't what you're saying. Too, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I exactly. think one of the things that I've noticed help people to move on. You know, will this number allow you to move on? That's actually a really important part of the planning phase. That often people who are selling are buying, right? In almost every case, people who sell are probably buying something else. 
yet how much due diligence have they actually done? How much preparation, how much planning has actually gone on to their next phase? Because a lot of people just go it on their own. They're not even using a mortgage advisor at the very least. They're not even talking to anybody about what their next moves are. So often they don't even know what the minimum is they need to get at this auction to move forward. And it, for them, it's a game and they don't want to lose it. They just want to get the most. But that's a subjective number. So how often do you sense that people are probably not thinking about their next move, that they're just thinking about this move? So often, and, and they'll often have a price in mind, which they, you know, they're, they're determined to stay um, absolutely fixed on. Yeah. Um, that can be really dangerous when you when you um, you know let your sort of pride get in the way of, of progress uh, so tr definitely try not to do that be mentally prepared that you'll need to make some pretty quick decisions at an auction you know it, it, owners often get surprised by how little time they have to make a call you know the auctioneer is running between you and a buyer in a separate room and they're asking you right what are we going to do are we going to sell this house today or not yeah. um, so it's really important to have those conversations like you're yeah. alluding to beforehand to try and figure out what your sort of goal price is, what your price you'd love to get, and what your sort of grumpy walk away price is as well, yeah. and understand that these don't need to be absolutely fixed in the sand. Correct. Those uh, three numbers are very important. Hugely. Yeah. Write them down. Right. Yes. Before the auction, write them down. Write them down. But don't tell them to anybody. <laughs> Correct. <That's right. laughs> Give them to the agent. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do but it's really important to actually write it down because I think it just de emotions. Mm. Better word for that. It it takes it out, doesn't it? It takes all that emotion out because you really you're just performing according to a pre-agreed script that yep. you have set. If there's a partner involved, you brought your partner in on this decision, right? We we really want to get this. We'd settle for this, but we could actually move forward with this. Yep. And really, especially if you're upgrading, the discount that you're giving away is nothing compared to what you're going to make in capital gains with the next move that you're going to make in most cases, especially if it's yes. a long-term hold. Yeah. So really, it's it's r the price of progress. Don't let pride get in the way is what you said, right? That's It's really important, isn't it? Really important. And there's value in progress. There's value in making a decision and, and moving forward. Yeah. One little tip which I use when I've uh, helped people bid or, or helped owners sell is you know, it's okay. You don't have much time, but it's okay to ask the auctioneer or the negotiator to leave the room. So I've used this with when I've helped friends of mine buy a house through an auction where I've just said, look, can you just give us a minute? And sometimes taking the sort of professional out of the room can just release a bit of tension mm. and just... That's yeah, a good one, yeah. Uh, it sounds weird, but you, just to not have someone sort of looking at you, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, of <laughs> uh, course. Well, can be quite sense. nice to, to just yeah. relax that situation, even if it's just for a minute. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Okay. So let's assume that the sale goes goes ahead. Yep. Um, the I'm just wondering whether or not there's any... Um, like obviously, we we normally typically look at that as the end of the role with the real estate agent that you've used to sell your property, right? But let's just assume though that you're dealing with a, a good real estate agent. What is their role immediately following the consummation of the contract? Someone's paid the deposit on the auction floor. You know it's happening. Sweet. What happens then? One thing we should cover off is. Because what can often happen is the house doesn't sell. Right. So sure. straight away the agent should be sitting down with you. Maybe they give you an overnight to to relax, but um, and calm down. But but they should be sitting down with you, saying, okay, these are our options moving forward. This is what I'd recommend. We should put a price on it, or we should go by negotiation for a few days, or sometimes we should jump into another auction campaign. Um, they'll be letting you know what they're going to do to bring about some action. Uh, so they should be going back to everyone who visited the property, letting them know it's now available by negotiation, if you will. Sure. Uh, so you want it, You want them to have a plan in place. Sure. And you want to be sitting down with them straight away, not just sort of letting it sit on the internet with auction written on it, you know, yeah. two yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is funny how often you see that. Uh, but if the house is sold, which is fantastic, then the first job of the agent is to secure a deposit from the buyer. Uh, so you want to get confirmation from them as to when that's paid. Uh, that's essentially your sort of, you know, mm. that money protects your interest. Mm. Uh, and then there's not a lot at that point. The the uh, buyer will have a pre-settlement inspection mm -hmm. a day or two before the actual settlement takes place. Mm. Sometimes they want to come around again between 
the sale date and the settlement to sort of measure things up and that's at your discretion yeah um, actually i've got something for you bring I've, it <laughs> I've got a message to give to every single real estate agent in new zealand actually when you're scanning a sale and purchase agreement or an auction agreement don't do it at 15 megabytes <laughs> <laughs> so nobody really cares everyone's got to get invest in this um, compression software to get it down <laughs> to actually send it to the bank or the lawyer Anyway, yes. keep going, keep yes. going, Andrew. You're Sorry spot for that. On. That, that another public service announcement. I feel like there's some low hanging fruit which the real estate <laughs> could really, real estate world could really use to optimize right. their service. That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but there's not a lot at that point. Once the house is sold, yeah, don't, don't expect uh, I guess too much to happen. The agent should be trying to help you strategize what your next move looks like. Sure. Um, and now that you've got a price that you can work from, you you need to be chatting to your mortgage advisor and, yeah. and figuring out okay uh, yeah. if you haven't already brought a home. Correct. Where's that going to be, and what that's what's that going to look like? So the the deposit is paid, the contract gets emailed to the solicitor, ideally to the mortgage advisor or the bank as well, because there's a whole process that's happening there. Final inspection gets done, settlement rolls around, champagne, whatever gift, and then that's yep. pretty much it in terms of the process, right? That's it. Yeah. That's and it. then what what typically happens? And I guess we, we, let's let's assume again that we're dealing with a, a good real estate professional here what typically happens ongoing from that point on if you've chosen a real estate agent to sell your home what do people normally expect do you think what actually happens oh, yeah it, it's it varies very much depending on the the agent and the and the location and the situation um, sometimes you know the, the relationship could be ongoing if you're looking for a property if you need advice moving forward yeah. um, hopefully your agent becomes a kind of you know, advisor for life, like right. a good builder or a, a plumber or a financial advisor. Uh, that's the ideal that you get to the point where you feel like, right, if I have any financial, sorry, any real estate yeah. uh, advice requirements, I can call them and just have a chat to them. There's no, Correct. even if there's no money to be exchanged, it's just they're the yeah. person I talk to. And that, yeah. that's hopefully what you're wanting to achieve, whether you speak to them every month or every year or every five years. Yeah, um, everybody's different, right? Everybody's Some different. people don't want to even know about them for like five years and I'll call you. Don't it's, Don't bother me with... A Christmas card, you know. It's a weird situation though because you you become really close with these people for this kind of six week period while they're on the market, and then uh, you know you, you get to know people Correct. pretty intimately in some cases, and, and yeah. then suddenly you you often never see them again. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's like weird. it's like a live, you know. It's like <laughs> yeah. you just crash into the Andes and you're eating all your That's friends, right. and now you just don't hang out with them anymore. And you're often in the middle of you know relationship breakups and yeah. deaths and and yeah, really yeah. stressful times in a and and a you know in a family's um, journey. Yeah. So. Yeah, you, you, it can be quite a experience that you that you share together. Yeah, well, that's cool. Well, thank you very much for the, for this, Andrew. And I think like if if you were thinking about selling, and you, you, most people go through this and they kind of go through it case by case, and they're and in a sense they're reinventing some sort of wheel because nobody really talks openly about what most people go through, and people from the sidelines see this all the time. Like I'm I'm seeing it all the time, and, and there's definite themes and patterns that everybody goes through. But when they start that, they have this information or this lack of information, and it's a progressive revelation as they go through this process. So I know, well, I know for most people listening to this, this might be the first time that they've heard all of these things spelled out in advance. And hopefully, even if there's just one thing that people have got by spending, what, one hour of their time listening to this so far almost, then then we won. So thanks for your time. My pleasure. I hope, hope the info is helpful. Cool. Now, if you want to find you, where would they go? So, best place to go to is andrewduncan.co.nz. It's a real estate consumer education blog. I write about uh, all these types of topics. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just really enjoy sharing that information You know that, that's been collated over years and years of working in this space. Yeah. Um, if people want to, they can book a, a consult with me for half an hour. They can look at my diary and see when I'm free and jump on if I've got a specific question related to their situation. Right. Um, Even if they don't intend on using you as a real estate agent, they could still use you as a consultant? Absolutely. Fantastic. That's the idea. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have a career in real estate, which has given me a lot in life over the years. Um, but, you know, I, I, what I see is there's a real shortage in the marketplace of just good, straightforward information for um, for people that are wherever they're based. Um, and particularly advice which is not related to you know a future commission being earned. Yes. Uh, so really I, I think important. there needs yeah. to be more access to quality information like that for people. Fantastic. And that's what you actually do. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again, Andrew. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Cheers. See ya. See ya.